For millennia, we've looked out into the darkness to read the messages written on the night sky. Since Galileo first turned a telescope to the heavens, astronomers have probed the planets, the stars, the distant galaxies. But there are some mysteries so deep, the answers cannot be found with traditional tools. For those, it takes something entirely different. A revolutionary new kind of observatory. It's not a telescope. It's something far more radical. Built to detect a whisper of a signal that's never been directly measured. Known as LIGO, it is 20 years in planning, a dozen more in construction, and it all comes down to this moment, the moment LIGO begins searching the cosmos, on the hunt for a whole new kind of cosmic messenger. Let's begin. <laughs> Professor Ray Weiss has been dreaming about this moment for decades. Weiss and his colleagues had long been convinced there was another way to study the universe, beyond traditional telescopes. When you start looking with other ways of looking at the universe, this thing that looks so pristine and pretty at night and so placid and puts you into a good mood about coming to peace with the world, if you really look a little harder, you'll find out there's all chaos going on out there. Chaos. From the fiery collision of neutron stars to the eruption of a supernova. Weiss believes these cataclysmic events leave behind clues about the fundamental nature of matter and energy, even the origins of time and space. These clues are what LIGO measures. They're called gravitational waves, and they're not anything like the gravity you thought you knew. It was Newton and his apple that first defined gravity, the force that pulls the fruit down, the force that pulls the Earth into orbit around the sun and holds it there. But Albert Einstein redefined all that in his famous general theory of relativity. Gravity, he said, isn't the attraction of objects like stars and planets. It's a distortion of space and time, what Einstein called space-time. What general relativity tells us is that space is not a simple, flat arena in which matter and energy plays around, but itself can be dynamic. It can change its shape. It can curve. According to Einstein, space-time is like a fabric, and what we call gravity is the warping of this fabric by a massive object, like a star. A planet orbits a star when it's caught in this warped space, like a ball spinning around a roulette wheel. So it's not that there's a force between them, it's that the space where they live is creating these holes and they're falling into each other's holes. It's an astonishing idea, and it led Einstein to a prediction that when a massive object collides with another or changes speed or direction, it produces waves in the fabric of space-time. Gravity waves. Like ripples on a pond, these waves travel outward from their source, carrying information about the events that cause them. Racing at the speed of light, they are the ultimate cosmic messengers. Einstein's messengers. The gravity waves just permeate, they go right through everything. They're, the universe is totally transparent to gravity waves. Now think of such a thing. What that means is that if you get a gravity wave, it hasn't been messed around with. And you get what exactly happened at the source. As scientists tried to simulate these waves, they found that up close, near violent events, they can be immensely powerful. 
A passing wave causes objects in its path to stretch and compress. Stretch and compress. And if you're in a place where the gravitational waves are very strong, like near a black hole, they could tear you up. They could stretch you to pieces in one direction, squish you the other way. You would be very upset by a strong gravitational wave. But by the time they reach us, they are nowhere near as strong. Just as the waves on the surface of a pond get weaker and weaker, the farther they propagate, so do gravitational waves, which is why they're so weak by the time they reach the Earth. Just how weak are they? After traveling across the universe, the average ripple would stretch a yardstick by only a tiny fraction of the width of an atom. It's a number that is so small. Einstein saw that number in the 1916 paper and he said, Whew, this is just too small to deal with. Nobody will ever measure such a thing. The prospect was so daunting, it took more than 40 years before a scientist decided to try. His name was Joseph Weber. Weber developed the first real experiment to detect gravity waves, a vibrating cylinder. A clever idea, and although Weber's detector wasn't sensitive enough to measure gravity waves, the excitement surrounding the experiment motivated many. Ray Weiss, a young professor at the time, thought he had a better way. The key to Ray's idea lies in the way a gravity wave distorts the fabric of space. This is what happens to space itself. It stretches in one direction and it compresses the other. It collapses up and down and it stretches sideways. And here's a gravity wave at a certain frequency. The frequency is once a second or something like that. That's what it does. To measure the stretching and squeezing, Ray turned to a device called an interferometer. A laser beam is split and sent down a pair of long perpendicular tubes, each precisely the same length. The two beams bounce off mirrors and recombine back at the base. The light waves come back lined up in such a way that they cancel each other out. And you add them together, you get nothing. You get a zero, a big fat zero. No light gets detected at the photodetector. But when a gravity wave comes along, it distorts space and changes the distance between the mirrors. One arm becomes a little longer, the other a little shorter. An instant later, they switch. This back and forth stretching and squeezing happens over and over until the wave has passed. As the distances change, so does the alignment between the peaks and valleys of the two returning light waves. And the light waves no longer cancel each other out when added together in the recombined beam. Now some light does reach the detector, with an intensity that varies as the distance between the mirrors varies. Measure that intensity, and you're measuring gravity waves. The light takes longer time in here than it did in this arm. Now it takes a shorter time, and these things don't cancel so beautifully anymore. And that is, in fact, the whole idea. By 1990, labs had begun to spring up across the world with the goal of finding ways to measure tiny gravitational waves with an interferometer. Yeah, I guess that's looking better. It's a big challenge. In some sense, you could describe it as a high-risk experiment. Oh, but the payoff is enormous, and that's the thing that keeps you really motivated. Now, at Twin Labs, in the heart of Louisiana, and in the high desert of Washington State, dedicated teams of scientists and engineers are undertaking one of the great technological challenges of the new century. We are measuring distances that are almost unthinkably small. These small effects are coming from these big masses far away, from black holes, from neutron stars, and that we are going to see things happening in the universe by measuring these small things.